Welcome to Journeys Through Sociology, a series of interviews with the Executive Committee of the International Sociological Association. I'm Lalebe Bohanyan, and our guest today is Dr. Tom Dwyer, who's joining us from Brazil. Dr. Dwyer is a professor of sociology at the University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, where he's been teaching since 1984. After completing his undergraduate study in New Zealand, he went on to earn his PhD at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. Dr. Dwyer's earlier research emphasized bringing sociological perspectives on work to the study of issues usually associated with fields like engineering, medicine, ergonomics, and psychology. In particular, he developed a sociological theory of error that he used to illustrate that industrial accidents are in fact socially produced. His more recent work has shifted to focus on technology and the information society, particularly as it relates to youth. And he's also undertaking collaborative work on BRIC with colleagues from China, Russia, India, and South Africa. And in addition to serving on the ISA's executive committee, he is also a former president of the Brazilian Sociological Society. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Dwyer. Oh, good afternoon, and um, it's lovely to have you with us, even though we're not here present physically together, you know. Yes, and I, I'm actually really appreciative of you today on Mardi Gras um, in Brazil taking some time for us. I think myself I might be tempted to, to wander off into the streets today. <laughs> Well, I certainly would love to be in the streets, but I've got too much work to do, which is one of the problems of sociologists' lives in a crazy world, yeah. Yes, yes. So actually, you know, I'd like to begin today, uh, Dr. Dwyer, with having you just tell us a bit about some of the work that, that you're doing right now. I know I, I mentioned some of the, the different kinds of research you've done over the course of your career, um, but can you share a bit about, you know, some aspect of your work that you're particularly excited about right now? Oh, uh, look, I've been drawn in since 2004 into this question of China and its relationship to Brazil. Um, and this was just something I didn't choose, essentially. It just happened this way. Brazil's trade with China has gone from 1% of all trade to 16% of all trade in the space of 20 years. It's become our number one trading partner. There's been immigration, there's lots of contacts, investments. And so one of the things that we've been, I've been working on has been trying to build, this is very dangerous when you don't know other nations, other cultures, other civilizations, is trying to build some sociological insights which will help Brazil confront this new era. We don't have any uh, Chinese um, sinologists who are trained in sociology or anything like that. So this has meant We've got four things going on right now. One is a survey of youth, China, Brazil, um, in university students to start off about values and lifestyles, just so as we can get to know each other in a way. Uh, a second um, question is obviously as the two civilizations approach and come close together, conflicts are inevitable. So I've had a, uh, a database built up of Brazil-China conflicts as registered in the press. And essentially the idea is to work these out and understand what's cultural, what's interests, how these play through. Um, in a week's time, I'm gonna be starting giving a course on introduction to the sociology of China for undergraduate students. So that'll be a first in Brazil. And um, in the same uh, breath, we're setting up a, a study on uh, a group in our Center of Advanced Studies at the university to study China. So that's just one question, China. And then another question is, you asked for three originally. Um, so the next question is BRIC sociology. Now this is a question, I mean, there's these theses about how the world is going changing and things. And one of them is that, okay, the, the BRICs will by the year 2050, it'll probably be earlier now, become equivalent to the G6 today. Um, in terms of their size. Now, that happening, of course, this means quite a, a reconfiguration of power in the world. And what's the problem? I mean, okay, Russia and China know each other quite well, and India knows, China knows old India, but not contemporary India. South Africa, nobody really knows well. Certainly Brazil would be closest to South Africa. And we have to somehow talk together. And sociologists are a part of this, so 
2009, the president of the Chinese Associ Sociological Association called the presidents of the BRICS to Beijing and said, OK, let's get to know each other better. So in October last year, we put out a book with um, eight sections and authored chapters in each section, four countries at that time, because South Africa wasn't a BRIC, on social stratification in the BRICS. So we learned about each other's statistics, we learned about how each other one classified hierarchy, we learned about um, social stratification and consumption, I mean, how the consumption patterns different, the working class, the middle classes, peasants, and now I'm responsible, which should come out um, the next year, for youth, sociology of youth in the BRIC countries. So that, that's the second big project. That's a, a real, it's extraordinarily complex. And the third is I'm on the editorial review board of a French review, Hermès, which is a review of communication culture, and it treats a lot of these questions linked to tech, information technology, the past, and intercultural understanding. It's a very interdisciplinary, very wide project, and tries to do science without being too scientific and, and too close. So that's three things that really get me going right now. So, I mean, and it's clear, Dr. Dwyer, from the, what you just shared with us, that, that you see kind of, you see the value of bringing a sociological perspective, in, in this case, to these relations between BRIC countries, um, but I know also through the course of your work, to a whole range of issues that, that um, you know, really bringing kind of a, a sociological way of thinking to those analyses. And so can you maybe just share with us, you know, in, in your own trajectory, what was it that drew you to sociology um, and that, that made this a kind of tempting way to think about the world? Um, well, I'm, a, I'm a, the, uh, an immigrant from an immigrant family, an Irish immigrant family to New Zealand. So one of the things, of course, when you are immigrant is you're I mean, never felt a part of the society in which I was. And this was always a bit of a problem until I went to university knowing I wanted to deal with people. I hadn't even heard of sociology at that stage. Went to university and um, in the, I did business administration, or at least it was dealing with people. And then went to, in the holidays, New Zealand was a very egalitarian society at that period and um, great labor shortages. So I went and worked in a car factory in the summer holidays and was in a group of five or something. And it was five people, actually. And at one stage, we had a problem with the job. And after two days of complaining about it, the leader of the team said, OK, let's stop work. So we did a wildcat strike. And this was extraordinary for me because it was just something unplanned. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to, because it was complete reverse of what we learned about in administration. So I thought, where on earth am I going to learn about this? So what I did is I went and I looked around and I found sociology and I found estrangement was no longer something that was bad or something finally valued, given value to, not understanding the world that you're in. So that was the very beginning of um, that. And then after a year of sociology, I went to the United States. Um, I had a work visa to go there and because I've been always saying, as an immigrant, you again want to go and see the world. So always, all my pennies I'd saved up were all to go traveling. And I went to California, and it was the hippie period, it was the anti-Vietnam War period, the greening of America, the world was changing. It was the most extraordinary thing I could imagine. And then I went back four years later, three years later after finishing my undergraduate work, and it was the petrol crisis, 1974, everything had changed. My radical friends had become conservative. California was no longer pumping. It was some, the United States no longer had its capacity to excite us. And this was the biggest deception of my life. On that same trip, I went to Europe. I went to Ireland to visit my family. And there I learned about things that were never talked about at home, the Irish Civil War and how that had affected the size of the family. And then went off to to the Scandin I wanted to see socialism, so I went to the Scandinavian countries and to uh, the Eastern Bloc and the two different models. I mean, one was nobody was poor in the Eastern Bloc at that stage, but they lived in a prison, whereas the Scandinavian countries, they didn't live in a prison. So that made me want to go back and study again. So I went back and did a postgraduate degree. And then I went to a first conference in my life. And the conference was amazing because it was Australian-New Zealand conference. And I realized that I could become a sociologist, it was possible, because I'd only ever seen almost foreigners as teachers in my university, and it was possible. You know, I had some ideas and stuff, and 
talking to a person one night. She said, oh, where are you going to go and study? I said, I'll go to Australia. She said, you don't want to go to Australia. She was an Australian sociologist. I said, where do you want me to go? And she said, United States. And I, so I told her about my deception in the United States, United Kingdom, out of the question. I said, oh, well, then you can go to France. And I said, I can't speak French. She said, you can learn a language. She made me promise to see if there were any scholarships. I promised her I'd go and see if there were any scholarships. Got a scholarship, and the rest was history. So that's a... You know, a funny little story, but that's how... You all throughout the world to yeah, your yeah. journey to... But that idea of estrangement and being an immigrant and never feeling um, comfortable in the society and not understanding it, that was the real key. Yes. So, and and I, I can see in, you know, the story that you tell, Dr. Dwyer, that, that many of those experiences clearly shape the actual kinds of research that you've chosen to do over the course of your career. Yeah, that's for sure, yeah. yeah. Particularly in terms of work and, and, and can, you, can you maybe perhaps just tell us a little bit about your earlier research on work? Um, because I think that for many viewers, it's a very interesting way of, of applying sociology to, to a whole range of issues. Well, the, the work accident question was, was funny because I, I was working on a construction site again and nearly had an accident. and. I looked at all the safety posters around. They said, oh, Dad, come home safely, you know. And the reason we, I nearly had the accident was we were being paid extra money to, to work under dangerous conditions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so then I went to the, a library and I looked up all the research and nobody said that there were payments for people working dangerously. So I thought, uh -uh, there's something very sociological here. And this was way early days. You know, no one had even thought of these issues in sociology. So I went away and started looking at and um, and that was when I turned up in Paris. I showed this to Alan Terrain and he was kind of interested in this because he'd worked in coal mines, interestingly enough, in his very early career. And so he, we had this relationship that was built around experiences and building grounded theory and then the micro-macro relations, which he's stro so strong with. So that was how I, I got into it. And partly life has been bumping into questions over time, you know. And so, and so, how, may I ask, you know, I know your more recent work has started to focus on technology um, and, and information societies, and how exactly did you bump into, into those issues? Oh, well, that goes back to undergraduate course, actually. We read two books. One was Alan Terrain's Post-Industrial Society, and another one was Berger and Luckman. And we read them both in the same course. Now, and there were Althusserians around too, so it was the whole thing of whether humans had agency or not, whether it was capitalism as we knew it as industrial capital and was finished or not. And I always found that a very fascinating idea that we could have a new way of, of building things, a new base of civilization as industrial capitalism replaces agricultural capitalism, informational capitalism. And uh, so that's how I came into it, but it was very much linked to those very, very heavy debates that we had in, in undergraduate at Victoria University in Wellington, because we had some pretty switched on teachers there, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of it. I mean, then, then things just go on and on, basically, because when I started that in Brazil, no sociologist was even interested in this question, but quite rightly so, because I was recently arrived in Brazil, and the big question at that time was re-democratizing the country. So, you know, sociology was putting all its efforts into thinking about how um, you could build the institutions and the, um, the social pacts and things necessary to build a stable democracy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was obviously not able to participate in that debate because I didn't have the baggage nor the knowledge of Brazilian society. At that time, at that time. So, you know, Dr. Dwight, the other kind of big question that, that we pose in, in these conversations is the question of the challenges that you faced as, as a sociologist. Um, so could you say a bit, you know, perhaps maybe identify for us what, what you think are three of the, the most significant challenges that you faced in the course of your career? I, the first thing is obviously looking at the world today is its extraordinary complexity. The second question, I think it's not so much for me, but it's a question for all of sociology about the, the linguistic question. And the third one would be about, we had to introduce sociology into high schools in Brazil. And this happened when I was president of the Brazilian Sociological Association. Uh, this was just such an extraordinary challenge. I mean, all of a sudden it became compulsory in 25,000 high schools throughout Brazil, which is about the size of continental US. And some states already had it, and so we had to basically 
get the teachers and help train the teachers and okay. write the textbooks. Can I ask you, Dr. Dwyer, how did that come about? How, I mean, because for, for those of us in places where, you know, most, most students never even hear about sociology until somewhere in their, their university studies, uh, how is it that that, that came to be in, in Brazil? Oh, my hero. This is a very long story. Like, before Durkheim had the chair in sociology, <laughs> they were already thinking in Brazil of bringing in sociology so as to, to counteract the judicial, um, the law tradition, because law was abstract and sociology at least was a new society in formation, so this would give knowledge. And so sociology did turn up in the curricula from quite an early stage, 1940s, 1930s there was even some in some of the high schools and then the 1950s it was around and then the military regime took it out so it came back in essentially the, in the undoing of all the things the military regime uh, had done which would include taking philosophy and sociology out sociology was brought back in with the idea of giving intelligibility to the society which is in a process of construction but um, you know, as president of the society, we didn't expect it would come in so fast and be mandated to come in that quickly. And so we had to, you know, there's all sorts of historians and geographers didn't like it, but you had to, and there were people in our milieu, of course, didn't like it at all. They wanted sociology to be a university discipline, but that was a huge challenge. As president, I mean, obviously you get a huge team dealing with this. And we had some excellent people working with us, but that was a real challenge. And so did you, you all played a role in actually shaping the nature of the curriculum um, or? Yeah, that's done on a state to state basis, basically. I mean, okay, there is a, there's a national curriculum um, guidelines, which the Brazilian Sociological Society had suggested the three people who formed that to the Minister of Education. So that was done quite a way before sociology actually came in, mm -hmm. but that was written, and they were very, very well done. Thank heaven, that's what saved it. You know, the other big problem, of course, was not to confuse sociology with ideology or with religion, which is always a tendency. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we had, a, uh, and this we had many negotiations with different levels of government, all sorts of people involved. But that was a fascinating challenge. Okay, yeah. Amazing. Um, you also you spoke about the the, cha the linguistic challenge, the challenge of language, which I can imagine what you mean. But could you say a few more words about that? And well, when you're dealing with the, the the brick meeting we had in Beijing, launching the book, there was something very interesting there, because everybody was essentially, besides me and the Indian, perhaps you know, um, talking in their second language. And normally, when you talk in an international thing in a second language, you know, you're really worried about not making mistakes, but because everybody was able to make mistakes, it was things flowed well. And so we've got this idea, there's this idea running around that, that English can be a, a lingua franca. Well, that idea is just, you know, not on, it's not feasible. You've got concepts, you've got words that have differences. And, and so this is a real problem. We're producing a lot of false understanding when in a world with the extraordinary tensions and stuff we have, we cannot imagine that any can, anything can be reduced back into an instrumental relationship of language and where concepts are all flattened. And so I've written a little bit about this, and I think it's something that's very important. For Brazilian sociology, the tendency is partly to go into a ghetto. You know, so you'll go into Lusophone sociology, which is a Portuguese language country, so it's 200 50 million maybe at the very most, or, okay, Latin American sociology, which is regional and linguistically very similar, rather than, so that closes us off. It's very nice to be in those milieus because you don't, you know, you feel comfortable. Um, going out into a more English-speaking world, things get more difficult. But then there's the other problem of the British Academy of Sciences did a report where essentially they decided, said that English uh, social science were losing competitiveness because they were becoming monolingual. And this is certainly in an area of globalization. I think ISA should go back probably to the idea that we need to have students with multilingual capacities, because this firstly allows you to have an idea of estrangement. You know, you, you think yourself differently. You also become very humble about languages when you learn to speak a second one. I mean, it's, it's not easy. 
Um, and then you become much more sensitive to concepts and words and, and meanings and what they mean. It so sounds I think like the, the, the challenge of language actually forces one to take on a sociological imagination about things, to actually think and, sociologically because of that, that slight discomfort. Yeah, that's, that's dead right. And wh what we're finding in the BRICS, of course, is that new themes and stuff come up. But the linguistic question is a very, very heavy one that we're going to have to deal with, and we're going to probably have to invest in translators from Chinese to Portuguese and from Chinese to Hindi and from Portuguese to Hindi, and it's going to be a real mess, but this is going to be the price of globalization in some way. Having a beer and having a laugh, okay, you can do it in whatever lingua franca you've got, but for science and meaning and stuff, we need to move somewhere else, I think. So that's a, a, a very much a an issue, I think a challenge um, that's come up for me. And the other one, of course, is this, this whole question, everything is moving so fast in our world today. We've lost a cognitive capacity really to understand where things are going, where a lot of sociologists are all trapped in a thing where if you want to be creative, you have to be less productive, but creative requires time. But productive, you've got a lot of pressures to be productive. So what you do, you keep on reproducing what you know how to do because that's where you can be most productive. You keep on teaching where you know how to produce. Now, when the world is changing so fast, it means that, you know, this is a, a real problem, this university structure that pushes you one way. I and mean, what the world is requiring are new fields of um, learning and research to come up. And so people, and the costs of conversion are immense. You know, from one field to another, you you have to forget, not to forget about your bibliographies, but you, you know, to tool up in another area, it's a very long process. So I think that's a, that's a, it's quite an issue. And certainly of the disciplines around, I mean, sociology is one of the most important and most capable of understanding what is going on in this world today. Yeah. So I could say a lot more about that, but um, yeah, that's, that's it. And, uh, it, it, it's just such a puzzling world we, we're in, and there are so many pro possibilities of conflict, so many tensions. Um, you know, you think of the, the westernization of other cultures and stuff, and how that is it's great on one hand. Um, women have a better role. Uh, we've got civil rights that are accepted as a value, and then we've got all the other things of cultural impositions and irrationality, and then the rationality of the market that comes with it, destroy other ways of living. And so, you know, we have a real, you know, so Westernization is embraced on one hand and not, and on, on the other, it leads into tensions, development, the same thing, people get richer, inequalities increase, everything is kind of contradictory, and we've lost a capacity to understand, and globalization again, you know, um, so that's... You know, clearly, Dr. Dwyer, you know, it's... For you, a kind of sociological way of thinking is, is an important way of making sense of, of these kind of rapid changes. Um, but, you know, if, if this had not been the route that you had taken and, and you had not become a sociologist, is, what else can you kind of imagine yourself having perhaps dedicating your life to? I'm going to give the wrong answer to that. First off, if I'd known how the world was going to be today, I certainly would have learned Chinese or Hindi, you know, uh, way back then, but that was in the days of Maoism. If I hadn't been a sociologist, I would have probably been an owner of a bar. A bar is about bringing people together. Obviously, Irish immigrants built bars the whole world around. It's not only about bringing their fellow people together. It's about making society work, and that's something that I would certainly think I'd do quite well if I had the chance. Um, yeah, and so that, that's that it's actually, not very intellectual, but it's got that uh, feeling of um, empathy with others and trying to, in some way, make the world function. Yes, and I, and I definitely see it as kind of, you know, the perspective from a bar in some ways is quite a sociological perspective of, of kind of observing people, observing them come together, a space of communication. Um, but it, it's in many ways would probably be a lot more fun than, than how we sit at our computers for hours on end. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the question in life too. Of it. You've got adrenaline on one side and you've got reflection on the other, you know, and reflection is tough and you don't get adrenaline. So the life of a researcher 
is really very, very hard a lot of the time just because you've got to think and that's very tough. Whereas certainly the adrenaline of bringing people together and people saying how much they like you and all that and how much they like other people, that's that's great, yeah, but yeah. okay, but I'm a sociologist, I'm very happy to be one, you know, and yeah. so we should go and have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> And I hope that today you can go ahead and have a drink and, and, and have some adrenaline and, and enjoy Mardi Gras a bit today after oh. so kindly giving us some of your time. Okay, well, thanks so much. I've enjoyed this very much. It feels that you're like right so close to me. Doesn't somehow. it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Dwyer. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. This has been another Journey Through Sociology with Dr. Tom Dwyer. The entire series of interviews can be found on the website of the International Sociological Association.